I don't know if you all know this, but Best Buy carries Kef. How do I know? Because I actually bought these speakers from my local Best Buy. And if you're interested in buying them from me at a discounted rate, please let me know in the comment section below. So I bought these speakers myself to review because I can't get anybody to send them to me. I'm not buying any more speakers myself, at least not for months until I can recoup some of my funds. Uh, with that said, these cost about $4,000 per pair and they're pretty awesome. So like, they're not huge floor standing speakers. I could give you the specs, but you can read them online yourself. I do suggest that maybe you check them out. And one of the things that concerned me is when I first sat down to listen to them, my ears were probably about this high, about this high, this high, about head height over the mid range in my chair. At the distance I was, I was within about maybe 15 degrees above that tweeter line. Now, most speakers, most if you're like 15 degrees above or below the, the main reference axis line, you're probably going to be maybe a little bit too high. And it may sound not quite as good because what happens is when you are above or below that tweeter reference line or wherever the reference line is, like where the speaker is designed to be listened to from, <laughs> above or below, um, there is usually going to be a dip in the crossover region just because that's how speakers, standard two or three-way speakers are designed. There's usually a little bit of a dip in that crossover region. Three-way speakers, less problematic, but with a coaxial speaker like this speaker, it's much, much less problematic. This speaker has a good range of about 40 to 50 degrees where you could literally stand up and walk around in your room and hear kind of the same timbre, the same tonality as you would if you were sitting down directly with your eyes pointed at that tweeter line. And that's one thing about coaxial speakers. If you've watched my reviews, you know by now that coaxial speakers genuinely, genuinely, generally aren't designed for you to be positioned right at ear level with the tweeter. If you ask most coaxial driver manufacturers, they'll tell you the same thing I just told you. So with that out of the way, how did they sound? Well, they sounded good. They sound like a neutral speaker. When I say neutral, what I mean is true to the source. You know, so whatever's playing on the speakers, either music, television, or movie, sounds natural. It doesn't sound like it's skewed. So there's not a lot of high frequency content. It's not sibilant. It's not sharp. It's not dull. Uh, the only thing in terms of subjective sounds that I heard with this particular speaker is there is a mild recess in the mid-range area that can sound a little bit, maybe not quite as dynamic or crisp, if you want to go for words like that. It's not to the extent that the LS50 Meta has, because that one has a scoop of about three decibels or so through that region. Whereas this one's probably closer to about one decibel. And frankly, if I if I weren't really attuned to listening to that kind of thing, I probably wouldn't even notice it. With movies and things like that, I don't think you're even going to pick up on it. With certain songs, if you're very used to hearing the attack, then you might notice it. But overall, I don't think it's a big enough deal to really complain about, so I'm not complaining. In fact, it's really the only thing that I can talk about short of the bass. Now, the bass output capability of the speaker, as far as extension goes, it doesn't really get that low. It's got two five and a quarter inch midwoofers above, one above, one below, the concentric driver. Those five and a quarter inch midwoofers, I'm not expecting a lot of them. I mean, I, I've, I'm 200 plus speakers in at this point. I kind of have an idea of what to expect. And there wasn't a whole lot of low end extension. It got low enough to mate properly with a subwoofer. And that's really probably what most people are going to expect. In other words, they don't go full range. You're not going to get 20 hertz. You're not really going to get 30 hertz or 40 hertz. 50 hertz is probably reasonable to expect. But on the flip side, part of the reason that they don't get low is also part of the reason why they will work better in smaller rooms if you need a speaker that you can place closer to a wall. Like the KEF R3 and the R3 Meta and even the R5 non-Meta that I reviewed a couple years ago, 
These speakers have what is called an extended bass shelf bass response. And what that basically means is it rolls off kind of like a sealed woofer, but the port tuning is a little bit lower than maybe other speakers might have their port tuning. And what that does then is it just extends the bass a little bit further. So as it's rolling off, then there's a little bit of a kick up. And you're gonna see this in the data that I'm showing you in a minute, but I'm just kind of describing to you what that effect does. That allows you to put the speaker a little bit closer to a wall than you would be able to if it were rolled off like a typical speaker. And in that way, it really just works to reduce the boominess and the muddiness that you might otherwise get if you placed it close to a wall. I would not recommend the speaker if you're looking for a speaker where you want to place it out into the room three feet or more. I just don't think that you're really going to get the, the benefit of that. But I also would not recommend that you put it any closer than about two feet from the rear wall behind it. And when I say two feet, I mean from the back of the speaker to the wall behind it. I mean, you could go closer if you want to, especially if you have equalization where you can kind of reduce some peaks and dips. But I think that if you go any closer, then you might start getting into the point where you start mucking up the mid range because then there's also boundary effects from the wall behind the speaker that gets into the lower mid range. And that's an area that I really try to keep as pristine as I can within reason. But yes, the speaker does go well for a smaller room and when you can place it near a wall, but you're still gonna need a subwoofer. The overall sound, again, what I would consider neutral. The horizontal radiation pattern and the vertical radiation pattern. So I already mentioned the vertical and what I mean by that is the ability to stand up, walk around the room, sit down, whatever. As long as you're within about 40 to 50 degrees vertically of that tweeter axis, then you're gonna hear basically the same sound. Horizontally, it's a little bit wider. It's closer to about 50 degrees. Now, my personal sweet spot tends to be around 60 degrees. So it's a little bit shy of my personal preference, but it's not so narrow that I don't like it. A speaker that has a more narrow response or radiation pattern uh, is going to have less reflection into the room. So maybe if you have a smaller room or you have these speakers placed close to the side walls or the room is very lively, a narrow radiation pattern is going to probably be more advantageous. A speaker that has a wider radiation pattern generally would just sound like it has a larger sound stage, and I kind of like that effect. Now the stereo is an effect in and of itself. I fully understand that, but I'm kind of giving you an idea of where I'm coming from. The fact that its radiation pattern isn't quite as wide can work out to your advantage for a smaller room. On the flip side, it's not just the width or the narrowness of a radiation pattern, but it's continuity. When the speaker sends out room and when the speaker sends out sound into the room, you want those sounds to be evenly dispersed. You want the mid range to be as wide as the high frequency, because if you don't, then the sound stage can kind of collapse and expand depending on what frequency, what instrument, what vocal, what sound you're hearing. So for example, if you have a vocalist and they're in the mid range between two to 400 Hertz and they're 50 degrees wide horizontally, but then the speaker collapses in the crossover region because the radiation between the tweeter and the mid range by the designer was not well done in terms of crossover. That sound at a higher frequency at two to four kilohertz, maybe like a saxophone or something like that may sound narrow. It may sound a little bit more inward of a vocal that's on the bleeding edge of the sound stage. So when I talk about radiation, I'm talking about two things. Number one is how wide or narrow is it? And number two is how, how much continuity there is between that radiation. And I'm gonna show you that in the data as well. Now this is a three-way design. It features a one inch dome tweeter and Kef's matte absorber technology inside of a five inch mid range coaxial type design. And it does feature two five and a quarter inch it is a ported design. It does come with little bungs that you can plug up the ports if you want to, so you can make it sealed. The speaker comes in three different colors that I'm aware of at least, black, gloss white, and then a walnut color. Let's talk about the data. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. 
Average sensitivity of the speaker is 86 decibels. And we can see that the tolerance is about two and a half to two decibels, kind of depending on what frequency range you're talking about. Overall, it looks pretty good. Now you may notice this. See how the mid range is a little bit above my average here? And then above about 1K, this is where the average is at 86 decibels. And then above 7K, the high frequency is tapered off a little bit. That's an interesting thing to note. And in particular, let me explain why. With speakers that have good directivity, which is they keep their dispersion angle even, regardless of how wide or narrow it is, it's even. This is the thing I was talking about earlier. When they do that, typically what you'll find is if the speaker is flat on axis or reasonably flat on axis, then the high frequency in the room is probably gonna be a little bit too, too flat maybe itself. And it may sound a little bit bright by a decibel or two decibels. I've run into this with many different speakers. So while flat on axis may look great, sometimes flat on axis isn't necessarily what you need when you have really good directivity. So these are always trade-offs. In this particular case, what I believe is that the on-axis response flatness in the high frequency has been compromised intentionally to be somewhat tailored downward. And that's because this speaker has basically constant directivity in the high frequency. So let me show you what I'm talking about when I say constant directivity. This region right here, where this line is flat, that means the sound power or the sound radiation is pretty much the same, no matter the radiation width. Let me show you a better example of what I mean here. This is the graphic for sound radiation. For those of you who don't know, I'm gonna try to give you a real crash course. I've got a whole series of understanding the measurements. I, I encourage you to watch that. But basically, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the radiation. You want it to be constant most of the time. Again, there are exceptions. But when it's constant like this, where this dark red line, these lighter shades of red are pretty, pretty much linear, that can create higher frequency boosting, for a lack of better words, in the room. So those reflections pretty much had the same power as the on-axis response, and those reflections are adding up to the on-axis sound. So because of this flatness in the horizontal and the vertical radiation, the on-axis response is, I believe, tailored down a little bit in the high frequency, which yields a nice, smooth, estimated in-room response, like you see right here. The alternative would be a response that has a downward sloping response and then flattens out in the high frequency. And when it flattens out in the high frequency in the room, that's gonna sound a little bit bright. So what Kef has done is they've dropped that higher frequency on axis, and that winds up with you getting a smooth, downward sloping in-room response. And I'm basically just calling that out here. EIR smooth despite decreasing on axis high frequency thanks to the flat DI. I noted a mild mid-range scoop that sounds slightly laid back. And this is a line that's kind of based on what I heard subjectively in the room. So I'm kind of mixing subjective feedback with objective data. You might hear something different, but this is what I heard in the room. And I'm kind of giving you an idea of why I heard what I heard. Now on the low end, I noted the extended base shelf. So I'll get it back to this now. This is helpful for placement near a wall and it may lack punch when pulled too far from a wall. Now normally most speakers, what will happen is it'll extend on up and then it'll roll off, kind of fall on this curve right here if you can see my mouse. What happens when you put a speaker like that that's close to a wall, then it'll wind up giving you bloomy, potentially muddy bass this speaker with its natural kind of roll off and then a little bit of a scoop right here on the low end, that serves to allow you to put the speaker a little bit closer to a wall. And to give you an example, this is what I'm talking about. I said about two feet from the wall, 24 inches or roughly 60 centimeters from the back of the speaker to the wall behind it. This guy kind of reminds me of Stanley Tucci, by the way. Here we are at the horizontal contour plot again. I'm not gonna say much about it other than it's about plus or minus 50 degrees based on this negative six dB point, this lighter red right through here. Vertically, you can go about 40 to 50 degrees above or below that tweeter axis. Same thing I mentioned earlier. Distortion to 86 decibels looks good. 96 decibels still looks pretty good. Multitone distortion from 70 decibels to 96 decibels 
looks good, and this is without a subwoofer, but if you cross this speaker over at 80 hertz and above, what happens? You get something like this. Distortion still looks good. The compression of this speaker looks pretty good until you get to this purple line, which represents about 26 decibels of dynamic range from 76 decibels to 102 decibels at one meter. And on the lower end, we can see that there is a, a, an odd kind of response going on here. A few years ago when I got the Kef R3 non-meta, there was an issue with their little shadow trim flare ring, and that actually had a result or an impact on the sound and the measurements of that speaker. Now with the R3 meta, when I received the speaker, the shadow trim ring was flush in with the baffle. No problem. With these speakers, when I took them out of the box, one of them had the trim ring knocked out about one millimeter. And I say knocked out, it was forward of the baffle about one millimeter, which is what you're seeing here in this left side picture. So I measured the speaker that way first, and then I pushed the trim ring in. I flushed it up with the baffle as good as I could, and then I re-measured it. This is the result of those two measurements. So the trim ring protruding about one millimeter out from the baffle is in red, and the trim ring sitting flush with the baffle is in black. You can see the on-axis response results about one to one and a half decibels between one to two kilohertz right through this region. Off axis, there would be more noticeable results, but I didn't see the point in showing you all that. The main thing I'm trying to show you is if you have these speakers or any other Kef speakers, when you get them due to vibration and shipment, it's possible that the trim ring around that concentric driver is gonna protrude a little bit. It's gonna maybe have worked its way out. Make sure that you take the time and push that trim ring back in. Now it's possible you might not hear the difference, but I think that I would rather be safe than sorry, so I'm giving you that heads up now. It is a measurable difference. It's very theoretical that you could hear that difference in sound, and I'm willing to bet if you had a way to A, B it, you would. On its own, you may not, but better safe than sorry. I'm gonna do a quick comparison between the R5 Meta and the R5 Original. What we have here is the on-axis response, and by the way, I've done some psychoacoustic smoothing via REW just to make this a little bit more legible because when you have the graphs and you got the individual little spikes, sometimes it's hard to read through it. So psychoacoustic smoothing is set into place here on axis response. Blue is the R5 meta, black is the R5. So you can see the R5 didn't quite have as much lower mid-range, upper mid-bass output on the 100 to 300 hertz region. So that was gonna sound maybe like the vocals could be a little bit thin. I didn't have any of that issue with these R5 meta speakers. These do have a little bit of a dip in this two to three, one to three kilohertz region. You might notice that. I kind of picked up on it a little bit, but the main thing is the high frequency on axis is a little bit tailored off. Now in the room, what that results in is a more smooth in-room response like I showed you earlier compared to the R5 non-meta, which was a little bit bright in room. So I think that Kef made the right decision by having that little bit of a table or tailored down high frequency response above seven kilohertz because they're combining that with a very uniform directivity speaker. And what you wind up with in the room is a more neutral sound overall, as opposed to the R5 sounding just a tad bright. At the end of the day, I think these speakers are really quite good. They look really nice. There's some significant engineering in all of Kef's products. And I'm just continually impressed by what they put out. The output capability on the low end is gonna be a little bit limited because they are five and a quarter inch mid bass drivers. They're not even six and a half, much less eight. So make sure you're using a subwoofer with these if you plan to get really low or really loud. And that wraps up this review. If you would like to support my channel, I would certainly appreciate it. You can do so by using my affiliate links. I'll have some in the comment section or the description section below for this video. Just click that link, buy whatever you want. If you wanna buy these speakers or something else, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me. I would just be very appreciative if you took the time to use that link. It does earn me a small commission, but it doesn't change the data that you've just seen. Alternatively, you can follow me on patreon.com and support me that way. And I would very much appreciate that as well. If you're interested in buying these speakers, please let me know. Cause I got to sell them and generate some, uh, some more income or get my money back for them. With all that said, I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.